Hello and good afternoon. Hello and good afternoon. Um, welcome right now. You know, I know so many people have asked and continually wondered when is Shop Talk going to take the opportunity to um, return. You know, we've done another season which went up on channels TV, but we're always wondering when we're going to do something more, when we're going to um, continue and keep ourselves interactive. And in the midst of this pandemic, um, I thought it was important that we get back to having important conversations, important conversations that will continue to build um, young people up, build for the next generation and keep us equipped and in understanding and give us wisdom to continue to, to, to do greater things and to continue to make sure that as a people, as Nigerians, as Lagosians, that we are continuing to grow. Um, so I'm so happy that you know, so many of you are coming and joining and I will be going live um, any moment now with the, commi the Commissioner of Health, the Honorable Commissioner, Professor Akin Abayomi of Lagos State. Um, if you are here, just continue, just give me a wave in the comment section, just so I know that you're here with me. I'm looking forward to having this conversation and digging into so many things you know it's so important yes that we understand what is going on with COVID-19 that is one side of it because in this time so many people are confused what do the numbers mean and all these different kind of things but bigger than that I want to be able to get into the discussion about our healthcare system as a whole how are we going to make sure that we continue to improve the state of our healthcare system to shine a light on the fact that we do need to work on certain things and and so outside of the coronavirus what areas do the, do our healthcare system in, in in Lagos state and in Nigeria as a whole need to improve you know outside of covid-19 what ways can we improve um, one in terms of keeping our government accountable to our Ourselves, and also in terms of keeping ourselves accountable um, and taking greater responsibility to begin to do more. So I will seek to have some of those conversations um, with the um, Honourable Commissioner, um, Professor Akin Abayami. He's just waiting for him to get on here and then once that happens we will go live together and dive right into the conversation. I believe there's so many things for us to, to talk about, for us to for us to learn, you know, one thing that's important with shop talk is that is that we keep ourselves informed, we keep ourselves educated, we keep ourselves ready to continue to move into greater positions of uh, of power, and that the next generation are equipped for what is to come next. That is the very heart of the conversations for me. Is that we are going from a place where we start progressing from the older generation to this generation, where we start looking at ourselves as a younger generation. What kind of conversations should we be having? What do we need to know? How do we begin to improve? And how do we kind of, uh, uh, of go from a place of continually see, just blaming our leaders to preparing to be better leaders ourselves? So those are the conversations that I'm, I'm looking forward to having. And we will touch on different aspects outside of the coronavirus. Yes, we will talk um, deeply about the coronavirus. We will talk about the numbers, what they truly mean. We'll talk about We'll talk about um, the tactics and what is being done um, in terms of the response from the, from the people, um, from us as a whole when it comes to the lifting of the lockdown, the easing of the lockdown. What does it mean when we talk about things like herd um, immunization, all those kind of things and where are we and what stages are we at? We're having a very good flow of communication between the government and ourselves when it comes to to the numbers. but. We need to understand exactly what they mean. What does it actually mean when they tell us what you know? How many cases we have today, um, or is it is it more radical than we think? What are the reality of the numbers in comparison to the amount of tests that are being done, um, and where do we really believe the the numbers actually might lie outside of of um, outside of? So I'm just going to check and see if he's come on yet. Um, we're still waiting for. The Honourable Commissioner. Once he gets on, we will go live with him. But those are the kind of discussions I'd like to have, and I'd like to help us be more informed about that. And then outside of that, let's talk at 
about the health system as a whole. You know, what are the perceptions that we have about the health system? What is it that, that we are running away from when it comes to medical care? Why so many people who are fortunate enough will immediately fly out of the country as opposed to dealing with health care here? Um, what causes that? What is the standard in terms of education, treatment, um, financial provision for people in the health care system? How do we start to make sure that we can rebuild a level of trust between the community and the healthcare system? You know, what are we going to do to make sure that we're not doing things in a position of corruption and all those kind of things, you know, and so that we can trust the, the care that we're getting in this country? Let's talk about um, the youth mortality rate um, and our sheer population. What does the, the population density of Lagos State do when it comes? How does it affect healthcare? How does it affect the capacity and ability to treat people? And what role does education play in that? You know, those are the kind of conversations that we're gonna be seeking to have. So we're just waiting um, again for the um, professor to, to get on live and then we'll join in and flow right into the conversation. And of course, I would love for you um, mainly to remain interactive. Please um, drop comments, um, questions in here. Um, you should find that at the bottom of your Instagram live screen, there is a box next to the comment section with a question mark in it. If you have questions, I, I believe that's the best way to put your questions forth so that I can sift through the questions properly when it's time to, to ask questions that we all have as a whole. But any other comments, please put them down here um, in the comment section and let us feed the conversation and remain as interactive as possible. And you know, while we can right now, let me know some things that you'd like us to talk about that I might not have covered yet and we'll make sure that we try and get into as much of it as possible given the, um, the time that he has available to him. So yeah. Just hearing he should be on any moment, um, but obviously we understand that he is a very busy person in this time. So once he gets on, we'll jump right into the conversation. But please talk to me, let me hear what you have to say, and I'd love to, to get these conversations going. check up exactly how far I want to expect because so we're going to dive into the conversation and yes I'm very excited about where it is going and the kind of things we'll talk about for me I'm very important that we begin to hold our leaders accountable um, seek better information seek better understanding and then hold ourselves accountable start to ask ourselves questions what is it that we need to do better that can aid um, the, the um, that can aid the healthcare system in this country and all those kind of things. Just give me one moment. Yeah, if you have any questions, again, I ask continue to drop them in the comments and let's get into this conversation. Um, I'm already seeing a couple of questions have been dropped in with the um, questions box in at the bottom of the screen. But yes, just continue to prepare yourselves and we will jump in on this conversation with the Honourable Commissioner of Health, Professor Akin Abayomi, any moment now. Testing my eyes, I had to pick up the phone just to read some of the comments. Right, so 
we now have the Honorable Commissioner on here with us, and so we will dive into some of these conversations. I'm going to invite him on, um, but like I said, I want to just first off announce that Shop Talk, we are, we are intent on making sure that the younger generation are able to be, remain well informed, um, have good understanding of what is going on in our healthcare system, how we can help, what it is that we need to do to hold ourselves, um, to take on more responsibility, and how we can remain accountable um, and hold our government in accountability as well. So let's go and dive into this conversation. I'm going to go live now with the Honorable Commissioner of Health for Lagos State, Professor Akin Abayomi. Hello, good, good afternoon, Honourable Commissioner. Um, afternoon. Very, very good and very glad to have you here. You know, we wanted to talk, and overall what Shop Talk seems to do is we like to have conversations with the younger generation. What is it that we can do to begin to help out to make sure that we know what we need to be doing as a community to help you and what you are going to help us and just remaining informed. Now, a lot of things are going on with the coronavirus. And the first thing I want to do is address the numbers. We talk a lot about what the numbers are um, in terms of we get a good daily food or new cases and all those kind of things. But how can we understand what the numbers truly mean? What do they represent to us? as the people in the community. Okay, so we try to publish on a day-to-day -day basis how many new cases we diagnose um, through the uh, definitive test, which is the PCR, molecular test, which is a very precise test, uh, which tells you that you're either positive or you're negative. Yeah. Uh, that is, either you have the virus or you don't have the virus. So you may have symptoms that are in keeping with COVID-19, but not caused by coronavirus. So <clears throat> about 20% of those people who present with what they feel like are the symptoms of COVID uh, are positive for COVID. So the rest would be caused by some other virus or other bacteria that gives you similar uh, features. It could be even malaria, for example. So <clears throat> the positives are then identified and the current policy is that all positive uh, identified cases should be admitted for isolation. And the point of that is to try and reduce the opportunity for that individual to transmit the virus to other members of the household or community. So when they spend <clears throat> a period of time in isolation, um, we measure when they stop excreting the virus. Yeah. Um, and then after that point, we discharge them. So you'll see from time to time, we'll publish some discharge figures, which means that they've passed through the infection They've cleared the infection and they're ready to be re-assimilated into community. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of cases that we do diagnose positive, And for some reason, we can't find them. Um, either they've given us wrong information or wrong telephone numbers, or we go to where they're supposed to be and they've absconded from that uh, house. Uh, and the reason for that is... Uh, a number of things. One, stigma. Two, they don't wish to be admitted into our isolation facility. So there are quite a number of patients that are out there who are supposed to be in isolation, but we just can't find them. Yeah. And then we publish our, our mortality figures, which is the number of people that have died in Lagos that we are aware of. Uh, as a result of COVID-19 confirmed uh, diagnosis. So I think that's a, some, a nutshell of what our data represents. So one thing that I'd like to ask is, 
a lot of it is comes down to like you said the amount of taste tests that are done um so between the amount of tests that get done and what, what would you say the ratio is um between the tests that we're able to do and the numbers that you're able to you know affirmatively publish in comparison to the amount of suspected cases might actually be going around in terms of you know it's, it's hit the community now um so how do we get to gauge what we need to be doing as a people to stay safe um when you know we're seeing since the easing of the lockdown for example you know there's we've stated that people must wear masks but if you go out you find a lot of the time people may be wearing masks on their chin but not not wearing it um fully so how you know how sus how suspect do we have to be as a member of the community um of the people around us in terms of how many cases there really are So what we've observed about the outbreak in Lagos is that um a significant number of people are infected but do not show any symptoms. So I would put that figure around somewhere around 70%. Um so you could have the virus and not recognize that you're unwell because you have no symptoms. So you would be and that is why this virus is so contagious because um if you think about it if you had the flu yeah you would know you, you would know you had the flu you would either confine yourself to a bed in your house or you would go to a hospital you wouldn't be walking around yeah. with the flu because the flu makes you very unwell but covid can you can be infected with covid and have very few symptoms um and many people do fall into that category uh so while we talk about community spread you just have to assume now that yeah. everybody is covid covid-19 for your own safety which is why you have to practice social distancing and wear a mask um yeah. you're wearing a mask because you may be positive and so you're protecting the people around you from catching covid or at least generating not generating so many so much of an aerosol even by virtue of me talking now i'm creating an aerosol if i was covid-19 positive and asymptomatic i would be generating a, an aerosol around me and if there was anybody within a few meters of me they could breathe in that aerosol yeah. and they could become infected so about 30% of people will be symptomatic and then you would find that that range of symptomatic uh experience may be moderate severe or critical so the critical the severe i would say are people who are generally very unwell they're weak they've lost their appetite uh they have a lot of body pain have a high fever and then the critical are where the infection starts to interfere with your vital organ performance so typically we know that it's the lungs and sometimes the kidneys so if it starts to affect your lung capacity then you start to experience difficulty breathing and that's where we find most of the fatalities around the severe to critical complications affecting the lungs now if we could see patients earlier if people would present uh when they are in the moderate to severe category then we are able to start some treatment and some management that would um try and stop you from getting into a critical stage so it's really very important for the public to know that if you are unwell first of all we have to decide whether that illness is caused by covid if it's covid then we manage you according to a covid protocol and if you are moderate to severe then we'll give you treatment that will hopefully stop you from getting into a critical stage if it's not covid then you can go to your other hospitals uh the general hospitals or your private hospitals because we've given you a a um a certificate of non covid infection so then other doctors can confidently manage you for whatever other type of pathology you have covid is not the only cause of the symptoms that are characterized by by covid-19 infection so we can't um take you in as covid presumed covid and start managing you as covid when you might have malaria 
you know. So you would end up with complications from malaria if we're not able to define exactly what's wrong with you. So going into how it affects the community largely, right? One thing that I want to ask is what steps are being taken? We know that we get a good um, source of information you know, via social media and means like that. But when we have a huge majority of our population who don't have access to things like social media or data, um, what efforts are being made to make sure that the, um, the, the poor mass, um, one, understand what COVID really is, um, the risk of it so that we can so we can help them take care of themselves you know one thing that we see is a lot of information is being passed out in english um, what is being done to make sure the information is being pushed out to to the mass in different languages and things like that so our risk communication strategy is across the board it's in all the indigenous languages it's in pidgin english uh, we have a hierarchy of, of, of uh, public information strategies that go from, you know, the news and social media all the way down to um, the rapid response teams at the local government levels, through the primary healthcare structures, through radio, through town halls, through um, just the civil society organizations. So we're putting the information out as much as we can. You know, it's up to the public to um, assimilate that information and to uh, practice what we prescribe in terms of social habits and uh, personal etiquette, respiratory etiquette and hygiene. I think um, the Lagos population is well aware of what's going on. It's just that we have competing priorities for people. And, you know, um, people have to earn a livelihood. People have to go about their normal business. For you to do that, it sometimes uh, involves you disregarding some of the uh, um, public health uh, advisories that we put out there because people need to get from point A to point B. Some people need to earn a living, and sometimes that causes them to breach the advisory um, uh, issues that we generally put out there. But I think by and large, uh, most Lagosians, everybody's heard of COVID-19 or Corona or Coro as they call it. Hmm. Everybody knows about social distancing. Yeah. Everybody knows about respiratory etiquette. Whether it's a priority for you as an individual, is a different uh, anthropological issue. And so in terms of, we've tried different things. We started obviously with a stage of implementing the lockdown um, and now things are being, we're beginning to ease those kind of steps. There's been a lot of talk about things such as, you know, herd immunization. So what are we going to do? And where are we um, in terms of that? Um, is, are we looking at that as an option? And considering the fact that we're using the lockdown, it looks as if we're looking towards herd immunization. Okay, so it's important to recognize the different strategies. Um, the initial strategy was to slow down the, 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 the time between our index cases and active community transmission. Uh, and that's what we described as the first phase of flattening the curve. So what you're doing by aggressive contact tracing um, and isolation is to delay the time between the first case and when we've got full-blown uh, active community transmission. What that gives us as government and as a people is the time to put structures in place, the time to carry out public awareness campaigns. It also gives us time to assimilate a lot of the research that's going on around the world, because this is a novel pathogen. It's a new agent. We don't quite understand how it works yet. And there's lots of research going on everywhere. And as the research is being published, we pull it down, we identify it, we rationalize it, and we put it into our operational standards. 
uh, or our operational protocols. So the longer you can defer your outbreak, the more advantage you have. Um, you also don't want uh, to see large numbers of cases all at once. So that is what we describe about flattening the curve. Uh, all that means is that you want to spread out the number, the speed at which the virus is infecting people. So once you've exceeded your capacity to contain, in other words, there's so much community uh, transmission, yeah. it's impossible now for us to, first of all, identify how many people have, have been infected, especially, as I said before, that most people will not present with symptoms. Um, so it's, it also is impossible to isolate effectively everybody. So when we get to that stage, then we put into place what we call voluntary social distancing. So if you as a member of the public can practice the, uh, the advisory of decreasing the opportunity for the virus to infect you, then when the virus would normally infect two to three people per day, we may be able to reduce that to the virus only being able to, um, an infected person only being able to infect one other person per day, yeah. which again slows down the active community spread. So you must remember this virus, its mission is to infect everybody. Uh, because we've not seen this virus before, nobody has any immunity. Because we don't have a vaccination against it, it's not possible to acquire that immunity through a vaccination campaign. So everybody is vulnerable, um, but you only uh, become resistant to the virus if you've caught it, you've developed some antibodies against it, and you've recovered. Then that's what we describe as herd immunity. So the larger the number of people that have passed through the phase of infection and recovery reduces the opportunity for the virus to keep infecting people. Eventually, the combination of herd immunity, social distancing, and all the other strategies we put in place will now um, in encourage the point at which the virus runs out of opportunity and burns out, and then the outbreak subsides. But the outbreak could re rebound again in what we call second and third waves because there might still be people in community that are not have no protection against the virus. So if we get a second wave, then the virus will be looking for everyone else that hasn't experienced the virus or has been given some kind of vaccination. So that's why in these outbreaks, typically around the world, in the experience we have, is you have multiple waves, um, the first wave, the second wave, the third wave. Generally speaking, the waves get smaller and smaller because the uh, opportunity for the virus to find people who are susceptible to it decreases with, with each wave. Yeah. And that's the natural phenomenon of pandemics. I want to slightly pivot um, to, the, to two issues that have a huge effect, one on COVID-19, but in a, our health system as a whole. Um, and that being the role of education and poverty um, in, in affecting your ability to, I guess, do your job. Um, one, like you said, you know, with regards to COVID-19, the information is being passed out. Um, but does education, how much do certain people believe in it or the effects that it has? You can be told as many times as possible. And then the other one being poverty, where even if I believe in it, what option do I have? I don't live in, I live in a home that has, you know, maybe 10 to 12 people in a room. So um, how does that affect your ability to do your job, especially with the healthcare system as a whole, um, even with regards to other kinds of illnesses? Because yes, COVID-19 is very, it's taking a lot of the shine at the moment, but it doesn't change the fact that our healthcare system was overrun before COVID-19 and had a lot to deal with in terms of you know, mortality rates and um, the shared density of population. So 
the what is being done to work uh, with different facets of government to help in improvement of understanding and education with regards um, taking care of your health um, and also dealing with the poverty issue um, to help people want have the ability to to deal with their health in better ways. So, um, you know, with a pandemic scenario, uh, there are three dimensions to it. There is the public health crisis, there is the economic crisis, and there is a security issue. And each of those legs of what we call the pandemic tripod, uh, each one of those legs has to be balanced. Otherwise, your community or your governance structure collapses. So you, if you have an overwhelming public health crisis where thousands and thousands or millions of people are dying, then as we saw during the great pandemic, the flu pandemic, um, because it had a higher fatality rate than, than COVID, then you certainly have a problem on your hands. Secondly, if you have a situation where the pandemic, the response to the pandemic is causing loss of livelihood, um, then you have an economic crisis, uh, which compounds your public health crisis. Now, inside that livelihood issue, uh, there are multiple layers. First of all, um, everybody has a different set of priorities. So your priority as a person living in a uh, low density area is not to get infected. Whereas the priority of somebody living in a high density area is um, being infected is of, of a lower priority because for a person in the low socioeconomic bracket who is more likely to live in a high density area or a slum, um, their priority is usually day-to-day -day securing of uh, the, the means of livelihood. So his priority in terms in context of COVID is survival. Whereas a, a different person has a different set of priorities. Their priority may not be survival in terms of daily income. Their priorities, because they have a much wider safety net, would be, I don't particularly want to catch COVID. So I'm going to listen to the public health advisories. Um, and then at the end of the day, where you have a large number of people that are struggling with uh, securing uh, daily livelihood, or where there are large numbers of people that are dying in public, then that causes your third uh, problem, which is a breakdown in law and order. And then you get a security crisis, which then compounds the livelihood and compounds the public health crisis. So our job as government is to make sure that as a community of Lagosians, that we're standing on three solid pivotal legs, the, the pivot of a sound public health strategy, the pivot of ensuring that Lagosians can still maintain some level of livelihood and some degree of social safety net, and the third, and just as important, is to ensure that there isn't a breakdown of law and order and civil unrest. Because civil unrest, the complications of civil unrest could far outweigh the complications of the public health crisis. So you've got to find the balance. Otherwise, you would find people dying of malnutrition. Uh, you would find people dying from violence or you would find people dying from excessive um, cases of, of the public health threat. In this case, it's COVID-19. So that's the very complicated um, governance strategy that, you know, there's always, why are you not locking down? Why are you locking down? Why are you not giving this? Why, why is the police doing that? What's this? You know, it's all government in Lagos State and of course, at national level, trying to find that pivotal balance between the three legs of the tripod of public health pandemics. Thank you very much. Um, you know, moving 
on, I'd like to ask firstly what stage you would say we are now in terms of strategy and what we are moving into. So we've uh, exceeded the um, containment phase. In other words, it's impossible now for us to identify every positive person and contain them. So we are what we describe as uh, the active community transmission stage. So the virus is moving re relatively um, in a sustained manner through the community, and it's trying to find people that are vulnerable to it. So what we're now doing is we haven't abandoned the containment strategy altogether. We're asking that if you're still positive, we'll try our best to move you into an isolation facility. But we're also decentralizing isolation now, and we're promoting the concept that we will isolate you at the level of the primary healthcare structure in your community. So we still would advise that you isolate at home, uh, and we're moving into that phase right now. Um, and then uh, what we really want to do is to save lives. So those people that are in the moderate to severe category who are feeling unwell for a protracted period of time, they've got severe lethargy, they're weak, they're not eating, they're dehydrated, they have high fever, they generally feel very unwell. Those are the people that we want to move into our institutions where we can have the ability to supervise them more closely with experts in the field, start some kind of antiviral therapy, rehydrate them. And if they start to develop respiratory symptoms, which means that they're moving from severe to critical, that we can rescue them from a place of no return. So our attention is moving in two directions. It's moving to community-based isolation and central uh, focus on patients that we know are exhibiting the features that are possibly going to lead to you uh, becoming critically unwell. And those are the types of people that we want to pay attention to. While we know that the, um, the active uh, community transmission is going on and majority of people are going to have an asymptomatic to mild course of COVID-19, they will recover regardless of what we do. Um, and they're not in danger of dying. Those that are in danger of dying are the ones with persistent symptoms that they become weak, they become unwell. Those are the people that we really need to get to know about. And we're relying on the public to inform us through our numerous helplines, our telemedicine, our call centers, um, or through social media, that there is somebody who is not well in this location. Um, you can reach out to our numbers, the 08000 Corona number, People are not using that number as much as they should. Um, it's an easy number to remember, 08000 Corona. If you can dial that on your smartphone, you'll receive attention immediately. And if we, if we define through the conversation on the phone that you are in a high-risk group or that you require testing or you require evacuation, then that will happen. You just need to call that number. So in, in, in summary, that's the stage at which we are, we are at in Lagos State right now. Okay. And there has been, you know, there's been a lot of positive feedback in terms of how things have been being handled so far in Lagos State. Um, and the numbers have, I guess, visibly been contained quite well. But one thing I want to look is beyond, beyond COVID-19, what would you say are areas in which this virus has taught us that we need to, to focus in our healthcare system, things that need to be improved radically? Okay, so we can look at two eras. We can look at the post-Ebola era, and we can look at the post-COVID era. So I guess one advantage Lagos had was that it experienced Ebola. And after Ebola, we recognized 
um, wow, you know, Lagos is very vulnerable uh, to this kind of uh, scenario. And so since 2015, we've been preparing um, for a similar situation. No one can predict what it's going to be, but it would be of an outbreak um, phenomenon. It could either be airborne or it could be waterborne. Um, so whichever it is, we knew that in Lagos, we needed to have systems in place. And so since 2015, we've been building strategically and systematically what we describe as a biosecurity roadmap. In other words, how do we protect Lagosians from a biological threat or a biosecurity situation? And we've put a lot of structures in place. Uh, we've upgraded our infrastructure. We've done a lot of training. We've carried out lots of scenarios. Um, we've had conferences. So unbeknown to a lot of people, Lagos has been preparing quietly for a situation like this. So it didn't catch us by surprise. Once we saw what was happening in Southeast Asia, uh, we knew that this was likely to be what we were expecting. And so while it took a few months for it to creep around the world, by the time it hit the Middle East and Europe, we started ramping up our strategies in Lagos and we launched what we call the incident command structure. That was several weeks before we got our first case in Lagos. So, you know, that gave us a head start. It gave us five years of preparation and several months of intense preparation, knowing full well that sooner or later COVID was going to hit Lagos and that Lagos has several vulnerabilities and we can't afford to be lackadaisical about an, a contagion in Lagos. So uh, our strategy has always been to attack a, a virus, to make sure that we minimize its chance of entering the community in a very fast way so that we can have the opportunities to put in place what we call medical countermeasures. And there are several aspects of medical countermeasures. And what you're seeing happening in Lagos is a variety of uh, medical countermeasures that allow us to cope with the outbreak. Uh, we can't stop it, but we can cope with it and we can minimize the damage uh, in community. Thank you very much. I want to just talk on talk a little bit about the faith um, that we have within our um, as a population in our healthcare system, um, because that is something that affects us outside of the coronavirus. Generally, when it comes to healthcare um, in Lagos State, we have quite a high um, child mortality rate when it when it comes to children under the age of five. Um, in 2018, it was about 9%. Um, and, that, and that is quite big. And, you know, so when it comes to those kind of things, how do we begin to instill a level of faith um, in our healthcare system as a people, um, trusting the kind of quality of care that you're going to receive on a person-by-person -person basis, not just within the private sector, but essentially in the public, um, public healthcare? So the, our mortality figures across the board are generally better uh, relative to the rest of the country. So Lagos has the best of bad results, if you like. Um, but at the same time, um, Lagos has some very peculiar uh, demographics. We have an ever-expanding megacity. We have contracting resources <clears throat> and those kinds of environments, because of the constant inward migration uh, from rural communities into the megacity, um, you could say that Lagos is perpetually a victim of its own successes. So people, Lagos attracts people um, because it's the economic hub. It's the, it's the big apple of Nigeria. You know, this, everyone's under the um, impression that if you get to Lagos, you'll find a means of escaping poverty. 
And so if two to 3,000 people are migrating into Lagos on a daily basis and nobody's ever leaving, then what's happening? So your, your, your population or your demographic profile is bulging. And there's a limit to what state can do to accommodate that kind of demographic uh, shift. Um, the public sector, therefore, has to share that burden with the private sector. Um, but uh, at the same time, it's, it's a never-ending cycle of, of problems. You know, the best we can do is to build robust primary and secondary and tertiary health level platforms. We can constantly um, promote or advocate for government to spend more on health, to spend more on research, to spend more on education, and to spend more on security um, and human capital. Because it's at that point where your human capital is driving your economic base that you have an increased awareness, you have generally more money in circulation and people either can, um, can uh, get healthcare through some kind of insurance system or through out of pocket. But it still doesn't remove the fact that Lagos, until the rest of Nigeria reaches the same level of um, development uh, or uh, the same level of um, attraction, then we're always going to be faced with an inward migration into the mega city of Lagos. And Lagos is just going to get more and more crowded with time. Whereas if there was, there was economic development across the spectrum, across all the states, and there was just as good development in the Southwest, then those states would create a buffer. Uh, why would you leave a state 500 kilometers away and pass through other Southwest states where there's less congestion, there's equal opportunities for employment, there's less um, pressure in terms of human footprint, you would stop in one of those other states instead of making it all the way to Lagos because life is cheaper, quality of life is better. Um, there's just as equal opportunity for uh, income and livelihood generation. So it's a matter of time till our surrounding states, Ogun State, or your state, Ocean State, you know, de develop to a level of attraction, economic attraction where I would possibly in Lagos say, for example, wow, Lagos is too expensive. You know, I'm going to move to Oyo State, or I'm going to move to Ogun State, or I'm going to move to Oyo State or Ekiti State, where life is easier, accommodation is cheaper, food is cheaper, um, your, your children have uh, less of a congested environment. It doesn't take me three hours to get to work. Um, you know, so those are some of the decisions that we as people are going to have to make over the next decade. You know, what is the quality of life that you want for yourself and for your family? And is Lagos worth um, coming into? Would you have a better uh, quality of life in some other state? You know, and when we reach that opportunity where um, those opportunities balance out, then Lagos will stop becoming that incessant magnet for inward migration. Um, one thing is, of course, the shared density plays a huge role and the amount of people coming into, into Lagos on a daily basis. Another thing is the birth rate. Um, and so what is being done in terms of um, educating, education in birth control and things like that, because the lower you go down the socioeconomic spectrum, the higher the birth rate. Um, and that, of course, we know is having a huge effect on people. Um, people are giving birth in unsanitary circumstances and not having or maintaining the level of health care that they need in terms of natal care um, for, for women giving birth and all those kind of things. So how are we increasing or improving um, the condition for women who are pregnant for prenatal care and also in education to, to kind of limit those numbers? 
So birth, birth uh, control and um, birth spacing is a very integral part of the government strategy. Um, if you've noticed, we've been opening lots of mother and child centers in the last period of time. Uh, it's always been a strategy of this government to create um, these specialist centers just, uh, just around the protection of mothers and their children. And they don't, they don't just serve as places for delivery, but they serve as places for uh, education and awareness around birth spacing and birth control and um, just sexual education, you know, and, and, and the whole concept of, of not um, changing that social paradigm of uh, the more children you have, the wealthier you'll be, or, or looking towards children as a form of, of social insurance. So um, once we have developed, we, we plan to build many more of these mother-child centers. In fact, we're about to commission two more. We commissioned two already this year, and in the next month, we're going to commission two more. And every year, we're going to commission two or three mother and child centers so that in every local government, uh, there's a mother and child, child center where we will be, that will be the platform through which we educate the community around birth spacing and how to look after the children in the perinatal period and how to ensure that these children get all their vaccinations in time and that there's good nutritional awareness so that as the children are developing, uh, they're receiving a balanced diet, which is related to your cognitive ability in life. Your nutrition in your first three to five years of life, including your perinatal period when you're in the womb, is um, directly uh, related to your level of cognitive skills. So if you want to develop a human capital, um, if you want to develop a human capital foundation to drive your economy, you need healthy people who are smart. And the only way to get healthy, smart people is to ensure that people have good nutrition at the time of conception. So the mothers are fed well and the children have a balanced diet through propagating breast, breastfeeding and a good balanced diet once they're weaned off. And for a period of five years while they're going through the early childhood development phase, then you know that you've allowed the brain to develop normally. And then if you add that to a solid educational strategy, then you've got a good basis for human, human capital development, which drives your economy. Thank you very much. It would be, it would be remiss of me not to touch on, on this subject while I have you here. Um, you're a specialist in hematology and have personally helped me um, when it comes to, um, to sickle cell disease. And you know, in Lagos State, we have high amount of, our, of, 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 of people suffering from sickle cell or carrying the trait, the rate of 2.7% um, of our population. And that is, that is very high um, when you look at our share population of people in the state, about 14 million to 20 million um, people in Lagos. And what are we doing to make sure that we improve awareness about that, um, about the, the healthcare effects across obviously it's a huge effect financially on families and the government um, in aiding people with sickle cell what, what steps are being made to make sure that people understand one what the disease is how it, it can be shared and simply just knowing what your what your um your your what your trait is and exactly whether your sc or ss or ac or as Yes, yeah, so um, sickle cell is, is uh, very prolific in this environment because of its uh, ancestral evolution as a protection against malaria. So where you have lots of malaria, sickle cell gene thrives because the carrier has some level of protection against the complications of malaria. So if you are a carrier of sickle cell, you're protected from dying from malaria. So that, that way the gene is able to remain high in the uh, general population. 
But when two carriers meet and decide to have children, then the opportunity for a, an SS arises because an AS and, an, and another AS um, um, procreating creates a one in four chance of an SS child. Uh, and the SS child is not protected against malaria and has the typical features of sickle cell, which are the multiple uh, features of bone pain, uh, sickling, anemia, uh, sometimes uh, respiratory, heart and brain complications. So that's where we need to spend our time. Uh, we need to spend our time looking after the sicklers. Uh, we have numerous sickle cell foundations. We have all our general hospitals are familiar with how to manage sickle cell crisis. Um, we're promoting the idea of people knowing their genotype or their sickle cell trait. So if you're thinking of getting married, it's important for you to know what your sickle cell genotype is. Are you AS? And is your partner AS? And if you know that you're both AS, then you have to make a deliberate decision on whether you're going to proceed with procreation um, because there is a chance that you might have a sickle cell child. Uh, we're also promoting the idea of uh, sickle cell clinics, dedicated sickle cell clinics. And there are some evolving treatments now, um, which we didn't have decades ago, that protect people from the complications of uh, sickle cell disease. Uh, specifically, I'm referring to a drug called hydroxyurea, which um, kind of mitigates the complications of sickle cell by altering the amount of sickle cell hemoglobin that you have in your blood, which is directly related to the degree of which you suffer from sickle cell disease. And then there is finally the option of bone marrow transplant, which is not an easy option, but the technology around the world is improving and uh, it's possible that at some time in the future, we may be able to offer sickle cell transplant as a therapeutic modality for certain categories of sickle cell patients who would meet the criteria for going through a serious treatment strategy such as uh, bone marrow transplant. But we would promote and we encourage the use of hydroxyurea. It does need to be used by a specialist because it has, uh, it needs to be monitored. So uh, generally speaking, uh, sicklers should be managed by blood specialists who know how to monitor and manage the use of the drugs like hydroxyurea uh, and ensure that it doesn't have its own complications. But it's been a revolution in terms of sickle cell management. The use of hydroxyurea has really changed the landscape of, of managing sickle cell. And also the revolution around pain, pain management has also changed. Uh, so we were able to manage our sicklers in a much better way now. Before, we, um, before we're just running out of time now, so before we... we um... We round up. I'd like to take one question that I've got in here, uh, which I think is important that we begin to focus on. And that is this. Um, what is being done to ensure the, we limit the brain drain? Um, you know, because medicine like law is, is in Nigeria is a highly reputable um, profession but financially does not pay well we find that we turn out that a lot of people who are quality doctors find themselves going outside of the country to the west and what steps are being taken to ensure that we minimize the brain drain and can improve the quality of, um, of practitioners we have in this country well i think in a simple sentence we just have to treat our professionals better and we have to respect them and we have to appreciate them. And that cuts across. It's not just a government responsibility. I think it's a people responsibility. I mean, how do you view your health professionals? You know, do you, um, you can go to a lawyer and a lawyer will charge you, you know, a certain amount of money for uh, drafting a document. And you go to a doctor and he, he charges you a, a fraction of that amount and you don't want to pay. Yeah. You know, so, so the doctor 
you know, finds his way to a greener environment where people recognize the value of several years of arduous training and several 